Hello and welcome to our Friday webinar. Um, today's topic is parrots and hormones. Is it time for the talk uh, with Dr. Stephanie Lamb? Welcome, Dr. Lamb. Hello. And uh, I guess so. Um, as a way for people to log in, um, I, I, we were just talking earlier about this uh, this incident that that happened with you recently. Um, do you want to give us dish, give us the backstory on what, what what happened recently with you and your birds? <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can see today that I've got two birds with me, um, as opposed to just Arroyo for the webinar. And um, yesterday, I fortunately had a incident at my house. Um, it just kind of goes to show you that uh, veterinarians have problems with their pets too. Um, and I, I wanted to bring it up because I think it's a good example of when things can go wrong um, unexpectedly um, and just stuff to be mindful of at home. Uh, we've talked before in the past in other webinars about um, trauma with, with birds, um, injuries that birds have sustained. And unfortunately, um, I had that happen in my house yesterday. Um, we had gotten a new cage for one of my greys. I have two greys at home. And one of my greys um, really, well, my greys just don't really get along together. I just they're able to be in the same room. They can socialize in the way of um, talking back and forth and maybe doing the same behaviors at the same time, but they really can't be like sitting right next to each other. It's, they just don't get along in that way. So we have to be very careful of them being together. And for the most part, we manage everything really well. Um, but we got one of the greys a new cage and there was a side door that I just haven't really this is a new cage. I just wasn't thinking about this side door that, that was on the uh, corner and I didn't latch it correctly the way that I should have. Um, and she ended up getting out through the side door in the middle of the day when both me and my husband were at work. Um, and my husband came home from work to find um, one of the grays, Maureen, she's right back there, on top of the other gray's cage. And there was blood in uh, the other gray's cage on the floor on the walls. Um, the other gray, Maureen had climbed up onto the other gray, her name's Gigi. Uh, Maureen had climbed up onto Gigi's cage and Gigi went for her toes because, hey, Maureen was on her house, Maureen was on her territory and that was not allowed. Um, and rather than move off of the cage, Maureen stayed there. Uh, and she, I'm sure, I obviously I didn't see it while, because I wasn't there and my husband wasn't there to see, but I'm sure they just kind of went at it uh, between the, the cage bars. Um, and Maureen got her toes chewed. Uh, so now you can see she's back here in the corner um, and she has a collar on so she can't get to herself because I had to stitch up her toes. And in stitching up her toes, she also had to have some little foot wraps put on. Um, and I can actually pull her out and show you guys. So you can see she's got these little like new booties. Um, oh, but so, so she's in a plain saucer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that I don't end up having her chew on those booties because, hey, she's a parrot and parrots love to chew on things. Um, she has to have the cone on. So she's got the cone on so that she can not chew on her booties um, and she can heal underneath there. And the reality is, is those sort of injuries with toes often take about three weeks to heal. So that's going to be our life for the next three weeks. Um, but it's kind of set up nicely. And what's nice, the Ava cakes actually are kind of perfect for her right now. Um, I can put them in this little foraging ball that she has and they can just hang at eye level for her and she can go and eat nicely um, without using her feet. Cause you know, most parrots want to use their feet to eat um, and they quickly realize that they can't use their feet to eat. And so it's kind of nice cause I can put that little thing just at head level and, and you can see she went right for it right now. So um, she's gonna probably be munching away and Arroyo probably is gonna want something too uh, because since he sees that she's eating something he's gonna get a little jealous. The good news is, is he and uh, more you get along pretty well so I don't have to worry so much about them but wow. yeah so uh, you know it's not something that I would have liked to have experienced yesterday but it just goes to show you be mindful of um, 
anything new in the home. Um, this new cage that I had, I just wasn't familiar with it and, and accidents happen. Um, and thankfully I think she's, she's going to be okay. Um, but you know, now we have the next three weeks of bandages and pain medications and antibiotics. And so, you know, something, something to be mindful of for everybody out there who has parrots, stuff happens, watch the environment and just try to look out for those things that could potentially be a problem and avoid them before they happen. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> and, and also just a reminder that uh, you might have two birds, of the same species, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to be best buddies, right? <laughs> or get along always. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's something that people ask me a lot. Should I get another bird for my, for my bird to be friends? And it's like, well, I don't know. I don't know how that bird's going to do, you know, and I have to say, I have two grays and they don't get along. <laughs> so you got to be careful. Um, so, but I know t today we're going to be talking about hormones. Yes, yes. And uh, I know that we had a little technical glitch um, with the PowerPoint. But um, before we get to that, I was just going to remind everybody that um, if, if we have time for questions at the end, uh, use the Q&A button. Um, so put that in your mind. Q&A button, not the chat button so we can capture it. And um uh, let's see. Oh, you got well wishes for Marine already. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, it's a lot to we'll have to do foot watch next time we we have you on. But uh, all right, so yep. <laughs> all right. So um, do you want to start with um, the presentation? Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can go ahead and get started. And um, again, sorry, my uh, internet went down at work. Um, so normally, where I'd have a PowerPoint for you guys to me be going along with during this. Um, I have I have the PowerPoint in my computer in front of me, but you guys can't see it for right now. But afterwards, we're going to try to sync them up together so that if you want to watch this later on, um, you can see the, the pictures from the PowerPoint. Um, all right. So, you know, to talk about hormones, we're, we've talked about this a few times in the past, but it's always important to talk about it again, because hormones are something that are a reoccurring issue, um, sometimes all year long. Uh, but it, at this point in the year, this is typically the season when birds want to be hormonal. Um, you know, in the wild, there are many signals that tell a bird to be hormonal, that it's time to find a mate. It's time to um, uh, make a nest. It is time to lay some eggs. It's time to have some babies. It's time to feed those young. Um, and those cues that were, that are often making them, uh, recognize that it's hormone season in that time of year are going to be things like light cycles, the increasing day length, which is starting to happen because here we are in March. Um, the days are getting a little bit longer. Uh, that is something that tells birds it's time to start having babies. The temperature is the other thing. Uh, as we're starting to come out of the cold weather months or yeah, the cold weather months, and we're starting to warm up a bit, that stimulates birds to want to be hormonal. Humidity is another thing. So in certain parts of the world, certain parts of the um, um, you know, we will have more rainy seasons during the, the spring. Okay. Um, we have more rainy seasons uh, during the springtime. And so that can stimulate birds to be hormonal in certain parts of the world as well. Um, oh, I think you have to unmute. I think you muted. Um, um, and the other thing is food sources. So um, if there is food that's starting to, to become more available, then that can stimulate a bird to be hormonal. So sort of all these things that we think about, about spring and new beginnings um, are really what's stimulating birds to be hormonal uh, in the wild. And, you know, in captivity, the problem is, is that well, captive environments are a little different than wild environments. Captive environments, birds are tending to be exposed to the same light, the same heat, the same humidity cycles almost all year round because we have our artificial lights. You know, we come into a room, we turn lights on, we may leave lights on for, you know, a lot longer than what would be happening out in the wild. Um, the temperature tends to be pretty well regulated, right? Because we want to be comfortable. So we often have AC or we have heating that makes it so that we're kept at a nice, comfortable um, temperature. 
our birds are kept comfortable as well, but sometimes that really comfortable temperature is something that may be kind of like what they would be experiencing in the springtime uh, in the wild. So that can make them feel hormonal. Um, so, so we also provide these really often secure um, and really resource abundant captive environments, right? Because in the wild, birds have to find and secure a area that is going to be sort of their territory, their nesting, what have you. And in our homes, well, we give them that, right? We have their cage. It's theirs. It's where they are living. It is their area that they need to protect, like I had just learned yesterday uh, or was reminded of yesterday with um, Maureen getting bit by Gigi. Um, you know, we provide them with this nice, perfect, ideal environment um, that is their space. And then we provide them with easy access to food all the time. We have them have a good diet or should be having them have a good diet. You know, that's a well-balanced diet, but that diet doesn't usually have fluctuations throughout the year like it would in the wild. In the wild, they're eating different seeds and they're eating different fruits. They're eating different food items when those food items are naturally available when that particular food is growing, you know? And we know that, you know, like, for example, an orange tree isn't producing oranges all year round, right? So they're only gonna be producing during certain times of year. Well, it's the same thing with every other plant that's out there, right? So birds have to find different plants at, at um, different uh, growth cycles, different times of the year. And all those things are really what help them to know when to be hormonal, but in captivity, we're giving the same thing all the time, or you know, maybe a little bit of variability, but not a huge amount of variability. And so that perfect ideal environment that we often think of as really great can make them feel like, wow, I'm in just the best environment ever. This environment is so perfect. I think I'm gonna raise a family. Um, so we can very much stimulate them to think that they are in such secure location. They have everything that they need. Uh, they have all the resources that they want to raise a family. Um, so birds will often become hormonal in our, our captive environments. It's just uh, something that's almost inevitable for most species at some point, they're gonna be feeling hormonal. Now, how much of a problem or not it is, is gonna vary as well. And it also depends on how we are responding to it. And that's kind of what my focus is today compared to previous times. We're gonna go over um, stuff like we've gone over before of issues and everything, but I also wanna talk about how we can kind of manipulate the environment and how we interact with them so that we can live as harmoniously as possible. Um, before we get to that part of things, just to talk a little bit more about um, what does it look like when a bird is actually hormonal? Because sometimes it's hard for us to really know as owners, you know, we're mammals, we're a little different, we're not birds. So, um, you know, what we may think of as hormonal, maybe not so uh, intuitive um, and what birds may be doing sometimes definitely is hormonal behavior, but people may misinterpret it. Um, and so things that can be hormonal, what does it look like in captivity? Well, nesting, and that's a big sort of obvious one, right? If a bird is like pulling stuff together and making a little nest, um, that is a hormonal behavior. But even amongst the nesting behavior, sometimes birds will do certain things that is nesting, but owners don't interpret it as nesting. Um, for example, sometimes you'll have a bird get down on the floor, go into a corner um, and kind of scratch around in a corner um, and kind of sit there all huddled up and like hunched over things. I have a picture on my PowerPoint that you guys will be able to see later um, of a gray, African gray sitting on top of like a little pill vial. And to us like, well, that's just a little object. It's not an egg, but in that bird's mind, that is the perfect little thing to sit on that looks like an egg. Um, so, you know, nesting behaviors, watch what a bird is actually doing. And if they're, you know, going into like a corner or going into like a dark cavity, going into bathrooms, closets, drawers, um, them looking behind things. I actually had an owner come yesterday and was telling me how um, their bird likes to, they come out of the cage, they fly around, they're really active, but they'll often go to like, uh, pictures and they'll try to squish themselves between the wall and the picture or they'll like just try to find little corners of where they can shove themselves into 
What is that? That's nesting behavior. That is a bird that is trying to find a perfect cavity um, because in the wild, most of our parrots are cavity nesters. Not all of them, but most of our, our parrots are cavity nesters. And so they like to find these little teeny tiny things to hide inside of. Um, and so although to us, it's like, why would you want to shove yourself into this small little area that's what birds want to do. Um, they feel secure in those little areas. And so if you see your bird seeking out little corners, dark areas, that bird is probably trying to do a little bit of nesting. Um, something else that can be hormonal is regurgitation. And so birds that are mates in the wild, they will regurgitate towards one another to feed one another. Um, and that's a very bonding behavior to do. And so in captivity, when you have a bird that really loves its owner, it may regurgitate to its owner. And at first, um, when you, if you haven't experienced it before, it may be like, what is actually happening here? Why is my bird throwing up to me? I don't understand. And then people do Google searches and find out that, oh, it means the bird really loves you, which on the one hand makes you feel great because, oh, my bird loves me so much. It thinks of me as its mate. But then when you think of it a little bit more, you're like, well, that's a little weird. I don't think of my bird as a mate. Um, so it's something that you don't really want to encourage it because we can have some problems pop up. Uh, other types of nesting or other types of oh, behaviors that can be hormonal uh, vocalizations. Um, and what I mean by that is sometimes you have birds that are screaming more. Um, they're trying to vocalize to their owners or doing contact calling um, is something that you can see. Resource guarding is another thing. And that kind of goes back to like that nesting area. If you see a bird that's trying to nest and you go to get it from like a little corner or uh, wherever it's trying to hide itself um, and you try to get it to step up, if it like bites you um, while you're trying to get it from there, that bird is definitely guarding that area. That bird thinks that that area is its nest. Um, so definitely an indication of hormones. Uh, masturbation is another thing that happens. You do see birds that will rub their little bottoms on objects, whether it's um, toys in the cage or perches or even people sometimes. Um, that is a very much hormonal behavior, something we want to discourage. Uh, feather destruction is something that can happen too with hormones. Uh, birds who are naturally nesting in the wild, there are certain species that may pull a little bit of feathers, but it's variable what species actually do it. Um, and I don't know that we know it for necessarily all species. Um, so there's still a lot that we just don't know. But for some individuals, pulling a little bit of feathers to like have in a nest area is kind of okay, but it's a very limited amount that actually really do that, or that um, is actually pulled, um, if the species even does it. And um, so, but you can have sometimes birds overdo it and pluck particular areas more. Um, and sometimes if they're having problems, medical problems with the reproductive system, sometimes they may be irritated and maybe pluck over the areas where like the ovary lies um, in females. Um, and then the other thing that hormonal behaviors can look like is sometimes birds are extra cuddly. So sometimes they are really wanting to sit with you more. They're wanting to be uh, interacting with you. They are like, leaning up against you, wanting their head pet, really trying to like be on you all the time. Um, or they can be not so cuddly is the other complete opposite, but can still be hormone hormonal. Because for some birds, you know, when you think of uh, a bird who has a mate, you know, if your bird's being really cuddly with you, it's probably it thinks of you as the mate. But if it is not being very cuddly with you, you are probably not the one who is perceived as the mate. Uh, you may be, you know, the um, uh, one who is um, the competition. Uh, so both of those things, really cuddly or not really cuddly, either of those can be hormone related. Um, and then the other thing too, uh, as far as problems that we can see associated with, with hormones, um, you know, I described all this stuff of what hormone hormonal behaviors can look like, you know, some of, some of those things really can go on to become real problems. And sometimes it's whether it's uh, turning into a medical problem or just a behavioral problem, you know, feather destruction, uh, maybe not being so cuddly towards certain owners in the house, resource guarding, vocalizations, if they're really doing a lot of screaming, all those things are can turn into big behavioral issues and really break down the bond that owners have with their birds. 
Um, so we'll often, or I, I will often have owners ask me, well, if hormones are such a normal thing, should I let my birds breed? Should I allow them to lay eggs? And, you know, it's not a super clear cut answer that I can say yes or no. Um, but I would say probably for the vast majority of birds that are pets, the answer is really going to be no. Um, there are, of course, people who have birds for breeding or people who have birds that are really into aviculture, but maybe it's not so much that they're, they're like pets that they're interacting with on a daily basis. Um, you know, of course, in those situations, it may be a little bit different, but for most of our birds that are pets that are interacting with us on a daily basis, we really don't want to allow them to breed and allow them to lay eggs because there's, there are several medical problems that can occur. Um, to, to hit on the medical problems, um, there are risks associated with egg laying. Um, if you have a bird who has been laying a lot, or if even a bird is their first time laying, um, sometimes it just doesn't go as well as it's supposed to. If they're a first time egg layer, uh, sometimes they can have what's called dystocia, which is a difficulty ability to actually pass an egg. Sometimes the first egg that they've ever had will be like this really large egg. Um, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, it can sometimes be difficult on them to actually pass it. And sometimes they need medical intervention. For those birds who lay a lot, um, they can also have dystocia or difficulty passing eggs because they've kind of depleted their calcium stores that they have in their body. When they're making an egg, you know, think of that shell of that egg. It's just calcium, right? That that shell is all calcium. Um, and it's, they need, that calcium has, has to come from somewhere. So it's coming from that mother bird. Um, and she is using that calcium in her body to form that shell of the egg. But then she also has to have calcium in her body to have normal uterine contractions and have that egg be expelled from the body. Um, and if she has been using up a lot of calcium because she is just laying egg after egg after egg, she can get to a point where she doesn't have enough calcium to really have appropriate uterine contractions. And if she's not having appropriate uterine contractions, she may have a difficult time passing that egg and then bam, we're in dystocia, um, which again would require some medical assistance. And, and one would hope sometimes that it's just uh, medical assistance of needing some calcium injections, pain medications, fluids, just sort of support. But there's several birds who that sort of supportive care isn't enough and they need to have uh, surgical procedures um, to help have an egg be removed. Other hormonal problems that we can see come about is uh, prolapses. Now that can happen in females when they're trying to lay an egg, sometimes as they're having that difficulty passing an egg, you know, if they're having difficulty passing an egg, I should say. Um, sometimes they actually prolapse the, the cloaca or portions of the uterus around that egg as well, uh, which is not good to have your what's supposed to be on the inside, on the outside, that definitely requires medical attention. Um, and then for those birds who do have like masturbation behaviors, whether they're male or female, um, sometimes those birds end up getting cloacal prolapses as well. That again, if you have your insides everted to the outside, that is not healthy, that's not normal, we don't want that. Uh, and so medical intervention and, and certain procedures need to occur in order to correct those prolapses. The other thing too is if you have a bird that's been laying for years and a good example is cockatiels. Cockatiels are very, very skilled at laying. Um, they love to do it. It's probably one of their favorite things. Um, but if they've been laying a lot for years, we start to see other problems too. You know, it can predispose them to uh, fatty liver syndrome because when you are laying eggs, you're essentially making this great little nutritional packet for that embryo to develop in, right? And what do you need for development and growth? Well, some of that calcium that's actually in that shell goes to that uh, embryo that's developing, but you have to have that big yolk that's in there and that provides a lot of fats to um, the baby that's developing. Um, and so birds are mobilizing a lot of calcium but they're also mobilizing a lot of fats. They're also mobilizing a lot of proteins uh, to, in order to make that nice little nutritional packet of that egg. And when they're mobilizing a lot of fats, if you're doing that a lot over years and years and laying excessively, 
Sometimes you're making too many fats. Sometimes that fat deposits in the liver, you get fatty liver syndrome, and now you have a liver problem on your hands that, okay, now we've got oftentimes a, a chronic problem now to be dealing with where a bird may need to be on medications long-term for liver disease. Um, or the other thing that there's association that has been identified is atherosclerosis. And, and we talked about that last month with the, the cardiac um, lecture that we're gonna be doing a follow-up on next month. But birds, female birds and birds that are hormonal, uh, those are some of the risk factors that have been identified for birds that have atherosclerosis. So, and again, it probably goes back to the fact that, they're the fact that they are mobilizing a lot of fats around their body during those times. Um, so, you know, the other thing that will often, or not often, but have happened enough, I should say, is you can get what's called an egg yolk stroke, where again, you're mobilizing a lot of fats around the body and you can have a little fat embolism that gets to the nervous system and they can have a stroke event. And you can have a bird come into the hospital where, you know, they are not able to move their hind limbs or just one side is not able to move. They're droopy with their wings, their legs. Those birds require quite a bit of supportive care in order to, to pull out of it. The good news is a lot of those birds that have those egg yolk strokes will pull out of it, but you're looking at some intensive supportive care for at least a couple of weeks. Um, and sometimes some birds will have some permanent, some permanent damage happen too. So the short, quick answer to the question of should I allow my bird to breed and lay eggs is, is no, uh, if it's a pet bird. Now, again, there's People will have birds for, for breeding and for um, aviculture purposes and, and different, you know, different story. Um, so ma vast majority, I'm going to usually, usually tell people to not allow the birds to be hormonal in captivity for the most part. Um, so we know what things can trigger them to be hormonal. We know the signs. Um, we know the problems. Now the question becomes, what can we do about it? Um, and there's lots that we can that we can do about it. And um, there's both medical management and there's behavioral management. And we've talked about medical management before, and I'm just going to briefly touch on it, but I really want to focus mostly on the behavioral management side of things. Um, but with medical management, we can do things like hormone therapy. There's hormone shots, there's Lupron, which is um, something that helps to shut down hormonal cycling. And then there's Desilorelin, which is an implant, which does the same thing. They both work to shut down hormonal cycling, but they work slightly differently in that the shot works relatively quickly. Usually within 24 to 48 hours of giving that shot, that will sort of shut down their hormonal cycling but it only lasts between maybe like two to four weeks, somewhere in, in that range, um, versus the hormone implants. Those take about a week, two weeks to really start working um, and seeing the effects in the bird uh, of hormones being suppressed, but they, in parrots, last for about six months. So they're both doing very similar things, but they work on different time frames. So depending upon how the bird is presenting and with what sort of issues, if we're gonna be doing, um, medical management, then we need to look at the bird as an individual and say, do we need to shut them down cycling like right in this moment, right now? We don't want to waste any time or is it okay if we sort of gradually shut them down um, and have a more sustained effect? Uh, and sometimes we'll do hormone, the shot and the, the implant together. Uh, just, it depends. So every bird's different. And so for anybody watching this um, and wondering what they should do, it's definitely something you have to talk with your veterinarian um, individually and find out what's right for your bird. So. But um, to go over the, the behavioral side of things, um, there is a lot that we can do to try to make birds feel less hormonal and be able to live in our, our homes with us in a little bit more of a harmonious way. Um, and I, I will say that the uh, behavioral side of things, the behavioral management tends to have a lot more long lasting effect um, because it's altering the environment and um, altering the ways that we interact with our birds to make them feel less hormonal long-term. Uh, the hormone therapy, it's, you know, fixed amount of time, as I mentioned, for how long it lasts for. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't, it's kind of a band-aid. Uh, you, you want to really be working on the behavioral side, side of things quite a bit to have good long-term success. But um, the big things I wanted to talk about is foraging, trick training, um, and then also um, dietary adjustments. So um, dietary adjustments, those things 
are where, or what dietary adjustments really is, is we are trying to make it so that they aren't having as abundant of food as what would be hormonally stimulating for them. Because again, if we go back to what are the key factors that make a bird feel hormonal, one of those things is an abundance of food sources, right? Because in the springtime, usually we have new things growing, new plants that are um, uh, producing fruits and things like that, that now we have a whole bunch of food for us that's available for us so we can raise a family. So in captivity, we try to not provide so much abundance of food to make them feel like they're just the king of the world and they have everything that they need. Um, so you really want to feed them the amount of food that they need per day. And we've talked about this before as well in previous webinars. Uh, there was a webinar a while back where I had given a little list of how much, uh, and these were general recommendations, but how much to feed a particular species of bird a day. Um, and you kind of want to stick within those, those general recommendations. Now, of course, if your bird has other issues, um, that's something unique to it, you may need to do more, you may, may need to do less. It just depends on your individual bird. So something that you need to talk with um, your veterinarian about. Um, but making sure overall that we just don't have an abundance of food, that we're feeding them the amount of calories that they need per day so that they are trying to not be as thinking that they have enough to feed babies. Um, now the foraging is also really great. Uh, foraging is where we are trying to get birds to look for their food. Um, and there's many ways to forage. Uh, there isn't one just set way. And what I love about foraging is that I really feel like the, the limit is your own imagination um, because the goal of foraging is to take bird's food, hide it in different things that they have to interact with to find their food and get their daily volume of food. And you can make really complex things to things that are less complex. Um, and I have on, on a Royals cage here, I have a couple of foraging toys, um, but like I have, I don't know if you guys can see that okay. Oh, he's gonna try some on me. We have like this one little foraging toy that I put food in and he has to open it up to get his food out from it daily. Um, there's little drawers and things that he has that he has to work through. Um, and then I also, I'll make foraging toys myself where I'll save like cereal boxes or tissue boxes or paper towel rolls. Um, and I'll stuff those things with food items so that they have to go and tear that thing apart um, in order to find the food that they want daily. Um, and it's a lot of fun. I, I usually tell people the way I usually have people start with foraging is a bird has its food dish. It knows where its food is every day, right? Like, because it has a food dish and it's been going to that food dish and it's been eating out of that food dish for, you know, who knows years. Um, and what you want to start with foraging is provide a simple barrier between them and their food. So you can take like a piece of paper, a Kleenex, a paper, um, a paper towel, something like that, and just put a simple barrier on top of the food. Um, nothing too elaborate, nothing crazy. Uh, and really the bird walks over to its food dish expecting to see food in there. Instead, it sees this paper towel or piece of paper, whatever it is. And all the bird has to do is reach down, pick up that piece of paper and throw it off to the side um, and then get its food. And usually they pick that up extremely quickly. Most birds, I mean, it's not even a day, you know, they, they figure it out within a couple of minutes that I have to move this thing out of the way. And you just do that for a few days. You get them used to recognizing that there's a barrier between them and their food. And then once that's sort of set um, and okay, they know that there's something in the way they just gotta move it. Then the next thing you do is make it a little bit harder and you can get um, a piece of paper, put a couple of pieces of their food in that little piece of paper and then crinkle it up and then put that inside of the food dish. And you do that with all their food. So now they have to tear apart that piece of paper where originally they were throwing that piece of paper out. They have to tear that piece of paper up to get just one or two food items. And then they tear another one up and another one. And so they're spending more time interacting with their food and doing something that's a little bit more purposeful because everybody has to eat daily, right? Um, so their attention is redirected towards something that's more appropriate. In captivity, when you have just a food dish, studies show that birds spend about 5% of their day interacting with their food. In the wild, they spend about like 60% of their day 
foraging around looking for different things. So you can see how if you take 60% of a bird's day and shrink it down to 5% of a bird's day, there's a whole lot left in that day where they have to be doing something. And being hormonal is one of the things that some birds decide to do, you know? Um, so if you take up more time for them to work with their food, interact with their food, then they are less likely to be thinking about hormones um, because now they have a job and now they have something that they need to do. Um, so now you have all their food inside these little pieces of balled up paper. Now what you can start doing after they've been doing that for a few days and getting used to that and figuring out that that's how they're gonna get their food after you know a few days, a week, what have you, um, of them getting used to it that way, then it, you know, up that difficulty level a little bit more. Take those little pieces of food that, um, or pieces of paper that have food inside of them, and stick them between the cage bars close to the food dish. Um, and often birds go, well, hey, that had food in it when it was in the food dish, so probably has food in it now. They go, they grab it, and they find, oh, look, there is food inside of this thing. Um, and then you start spreading them out all across the cage. So they have to go, you know, by their food dish or up to the top of the cage or down into a corner, just all over the place so that all their food is now no longer in the food dish, but it's spread out throughout the cage. Um, and then you can make it even harder than that. And so that's where I start to do like the cereal boxes and paper towels and things like that. Um, with the cereal boxes, I will put paper inside of those and I will, take again just a couple of pieces of food wrap that up in a piece of paper put that in shove more papers and then a couple pieces of food wrapped in a piece of paper put that in more papers on top so now the bird has to break apart the box um pull out a paper and maybe that paper has food in it or maybe it doesn't and so now they're having to look through and actually find what has food what doesn't have food and they're again just taking up more of their time and when you first start with that box make it easy keep the box top open but as you progress you close the box top right you make it harder for them to get into that box and so it just requires them to spend more and more and more time looking for their food and then those uh the ones like that i have hanging here for arroyo um you know they, there's lots of plastic foraging toys that are available um that you can purchase at pet stores or online um that those ones you know are meant specifically for foraging you hide food inside them and the bird has to interact with it now i've had many 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 owners come to me and say well i got those things but they don't interact with them and usually there's two reasons that that happens one, because the bird, the owner put the food in there and made it too complex to start off with. And if it's too complex, you're going to give up. I mean, it's kind of like asking a child who should be doing basic arithmetic to start doing calculus. That kid has the ability to do calculus, but they need to learn all the steps in order beforehand in order to get to that higher level of, of difficulty, right? And so if you have one of these more difficult foraging toys and you just made it like really difficult for the bird to interact with it and it's never interacted with that foraging uh, toy before, it's going to give up. It's going to get frustrated. It's going to say, well, I'm going to go find food somewhere else. So that's one reason that um, those may not work. The other reason that they may not work is because people put too much food out for birds. So again, if you go back to what the birds should be eating per day um, and you only offer what they are getting per day, they may not choose to interact with that difficult foraging toy first. They may choose other easier foraging toys in the beginning. And then later on when they're hungry, okay, now I'm gonna go interact with that thing because I know there's food in there. And you start easy. So if it's like the um, uh, foraging toys that the little like treasure chest um, that has little keys in it that they have to manipulate the keys, you start with leaving the, in order for the treasure chest to open, you just start with the treasure chest being open and you just start with having the food inside of there. And then you close the treasure chest and you put only one key in and turn it. And then they have to figure out how to move that one key. And then once they figured that out, then you put both keys to turn it and they have to figure out both. Um, and then it opens up and drops down and the food's available. Um, so, you know, you just need to start simple with those foraging toys that are the plastic reusable foraging toys before you work up to the more um, difficult levels that they, that they can be. And then again, the limit is your own imagination um, because there are so many different things that you could turn into foraging toys. I mean, I constantly find new things or owners come in and tell me about some new foraging thing that they created. I'm like, wow, that's a really fun idea. I'm gonna go try and do that with my bird. And you know, some, some birds prefer certain foraging things over others. So don't give up on foraging. I would say 
only feed the amount of food you need per day, number one, and two, start simple and work up. Those are the two things you need to really be successful with foraging. Okay. Just want to uh, point out that um, on our YouTube, Don Lefebvre's YouTube channel, we have some foraging videos. So that'll give you some more ideas. So awesome. Good. That, yeah. Um, and then the next thing I wanted to talk about is, is trick training and trick training, I think is a lot of fun because it allows you to, um, have a different relationship with your bird. Um, it, it's fun, you know, and when you have people, if you have a bird that's trick trained and you have people come over, family come over, you can have the bird do different things and interact with you. But then if a bird's really well trick trained, it can interact with other people that it's never interacted with before and do great at things um, and really have that bird be engaged with different people and different situations. Um, so, so, you know, I really find that to be a lot of fun as well. Same thing with trick training. You have to start a little simpler before you work up to the more complex things. There's um, some really great books out there uh, written by a few different authors on how to do trick training um, and how to step-by-step -step, like teach your bird how to do fun different things. Um, so I would encourage anybody who's watching these uh, webinars to look into those resources as well. Um, and, you know, birds are extremely smart, right? We know that they're intelligent. Everybody is always talking about how smart birds are. And if they're so smart, then we really should be having them use their minds, you know, just sitting in our homes doing boring things, you're going to get into trouble. I mean, think about kids who are bored. Kids who are bored sometimes get themselves into trouble, right? Birds who are bored get themselves into trouble. So let's engage with them a little bit more so that they don't do some behaviors that can be problematic, like being hormonal and screaming and you know being uh, bringing about problems in the home that can um, result in either medical problems or, or behavioral issues. So I wanted to show you guys um, for the last little bit here of some forage or not foraging, uh, trick training stuff with Arroyo because I started working with him with trick training um, really very early on. So he's, I think, really good at it. Um, and I just pulled out some of his favorite items. I don't know if you can see him in the back there, but he's really looking down at something like he's very interested right this moment. Um, and that's because I pulled out his little reward. Now, when it comes to trick training, um, what you wanna do is find something that the bird really likes and reserve it for those times of trick training. So in a Royal's case, he really likes almonds. Um, and so he often will get almonds just for when we're interacting and, and working on new behaviors or reinforcing old ones, um, or he's interacting with new people, what have you. And what I'll do is because, okay, his daily calorie need, is about like 55 calories when I've calculated it before. One almond is eight calories. So I don't have a lot of almonds to work with, uh, right? Because I need him to be eating a more balanced diet and we don't need to be feeding him just like almonds all day long. Um, so what I often will do is like, because almonds are his favorite thing, the most convenient thing I think somebody ever did was make slivered almonds at the grocery store. Um, so I go purchase the little slivered almonds and then I even break the slivered almonds up so that now I have just a teeny tiny little piece and he's not spending when I interact with him and do have him do some sort of trick. He just gets one teeny tiny little piece. He's not spending too much time um, interacting with it. He's just getting that little piece and he's ready to go for the next thing. So I was gonna show you guys some of the, the things that he's learned. Um, and a lot of these are, are simple things that um, I think are easy starting things. And I know some people who do a lot more complex stuff than I do. Um, so again, I think your the limit is sometimes our own imaginations. Uh, so I hope that there's some other people out there that, that are doing even more than me and I can learn something uh, from them. So um, with trick trading, the, the, you need to have your reward. Um, and then you also need to, well, you don't need to, but it's good to um, have a bridge. And so what a bridge is, is if he does a behavior and I wanna reward him for that behavior, I may not be able to give him the reward like right away um, because maybe I'm across the room or something like that. And so I can use a clicker as a bridge between when that behavior occurred to when he's gonna get his treat. And he'll start to learn that, okay, the click means I did the correct thing and now I just need to wait for my treat to come. 
Um, so we'll get started and I'll, I'll show you guys some of his fun things that he can do. Um, so a lot of times also, like I'll, I'll tell people when you're working on trick training, start simple, just like again, starting simple with foraging. Um, and one thing that's a really easy behavior to capture in birds, come here for a moment. Um, sometimes it's just simply stepping up, which I wasn't gonna show you there, is just waving. So wave, it's gonna give me a different behavior potentially. And it's gonna <laughs> give me a different behavior, but if I want the behavior not to be something that he just randomly picks, I can't reward him for that. So I have to wait a moment because he's excited. And he did give me the behavior, but I wasn't looking at him to reward it in that moment. So we're gonna try again. Royal, can you wave? Good job. And so he did his little wave and I clicked and then he gets his little treat. Um, and then because he likes this one a lot, I'll have him do it. Turn around. High five. Good boy. The high five is probably the most popular, I think, with kids. Um, and so when we were at our old office uh, at this hospital, um, his cage used to be up front and, and what he was in the back. And uh, so he would get to see the, the clientele a little bit more. And when we would have kids come in, um, I would often do that a lot with him because sometimes kids are afraid to, to interact with animals or, or adults too. People are sometimes afraid to interact with birds. Um, sometimes they want to also pet them like a dog or a cat. And a lot of birds don't like to be pet like a dog or a cat, right? Or especially by strangers. And so being able to do a high five, they can kind of touch and interact that way. And it's fun to see a bird get to do that. Um, target training is fun as well because you can target a bird different areas. Um, so, and I don't know if he'll do this right now, but if I ask him to touch, um, he can come over and touch. He may not always uh, show off as best possible. So there's definitely better uh, examples out there that I'm sure people will find on the internet. Um, sometimes he's not as engaged with wanting to, to uh, do trick training. There were some students here earlier today and he could do a lot of trick training with them. So he may be feeling a little bit like, eh, I don't need to do this so much right now. Um, can you touch? So I asked him to do a harder thing and come over to a different area and ask him to touch and he didn't do it. So I made it easier for him. And then we can bridge and work to closer areas. Um, and target training is nice because for some birds, like if they may be a little protective of a particular area, sometimes you can target them to go to a completely different area of their cage um, and be able to get them to be away from the area that maybe is more, um, you know, uh, protective, where they're more protective. Uh, and then we've also worked on other fun things. I don't know if he'll do this one, but Royal, fly. Good boy. So I can get him to exercise a little bit that way too, you know, which again, all these things, all that we're doing is we are just getting him to use his mind in a different way. We're getting him to interact with us in a different way. All the stuff that I'm doing right now of getting him to touch and fly and move all over the place. He's getting exercise. He's using his mind. He's not thinking about hormones. Yeah. He is thinking about I want that almond. I want that reward that I really like. Again, he had some earlier today with some of the students that were here, um, which is fine. Uh, so, and the, that's the other thing that's important to know about trick training too and interacting with your bird is sometimes they don't always feel like it in the moment. And if they don't feel like interacting and, and doing certain trick training things, that's okay. You know, you come back at another time. Um, this is also like he usually takes a nap at about like 1.30. So we're kind of getting right before nap time. Um, so, you know, he may not be as into it right now. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to talk about as well is another way to redirect attention that I think is probably going to be really neat for the future. I haven't done it myself yet with any of my birds, but would love to at some point is um, teaching them how to read. 
there is somebody who is currently um, she's doing a lot of stuff and some research with teaching birds how to read and it's really fascinating and amazing you can find her stuff if um, you you know do google searches you'll find her information about uh, birds learning how to read and she has like you can classes and stuff. Um, and it's, it's really amazing. Again, it is just a way to redirect their attention to something that's better to do than think about hormones, you know? Um, so that's something that is going to be really exciting for, for the future. Um, so I know we're about, I think, 10 minutes out. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that, that people have. Okay. Let's see what we got coming up. I'm sure oh, we do have some questions. Um, okay, so first one is, can you address the effectiveness of, um, I think you did address this a little bit earlier. Uh, can you address the effectiveness of, uh, is it des Deslorin? Desor Deslorin. Thank you. Or Lupron for hormonal aggression, or should this only be used for excessive egg laying? So that's a good question. Oh, okay. That's a that's a good question. Um, we I say I would say, in veterinary hospitals, we probably use it more for excessive egg laying, but you, you can use it for hormonal related aggression. Now, I will also say that it works better with the females than it does for the males. I haven't had as much success with it working for the males um, to curb aggression in them. I've had, I've known a couple of select cases where it's been helpful, but I definitely, haven't had as much success in male parrots with it specifically for dealing with um, aggression. I have actually used those things more for um, males with uh, certain types of testicular cancers. Um, so that's probably where I use it in the more boys more is for medical hormonal problems. Um, but yeah, I, I wish it was a little bit more effective. There was even a paper on how it was really effective in turkeys. Um, so if anybody has a turkey, then yes. Um, but yes, right? <laughs> <Turkey is. laughs> so, but specifically for parrots, not as not as helpful. Okay. Um, and then we had a question: um, Can hormonal season produce digestive um, issues, uh, causing bacterial issues? Um, seen as polyura with um, polydysphysia. Dys dysphysia. Uh, polyurea and polydipsia. So Thank polyurea you. means urinating more, polydipsia means drinking more. Oh and God. yeah, sometimes you can have that. Um, sometimes you ha can have uh, those sort of problems occur as well associated with hormones. Um, sometimes you'll have birds who sit in a nest more. Um, and I've actually had some birds who, cockatiels in particular, um, who sit in a nest like way too long and I even had it with boys who are like really 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 good fathers like they just want to protect those eggs um and sit in their nest way too long not drink as much get dehydrated and then actually get um either um uh, impactions like in the cloaca because they're just poorly hydrated and and get constipated essentially is what happens um or sometimes bacteria overgrow because they're not coming out enough to poop enough and they really do poop quite frequently. And if they're sitting in an area and they don't like to poop necessarily in that nest box um, and they're holding their cloaca more, they're holding their feces more, sometimes it can create a nice little environment for some nasty bacteria to overgrow. Um, so yes, you do sometimes see some GI issues with birds with hormones. Is there anything you can do for that? Like get them to move around more or? Well, that's where we go back to, do we want them to even be acting hormonal in captivity? The problems that, you know, that's one of the problems that can occur. So um, in those cases where like they are sitting in the nest box too long, is your goal really to have babies? Do you really want babies? Are those eggs that maybe even in there, are they even fertile? If they're not fertile, get rid of the eggs, get rid of that nesting box, which also does bring up um, probably a question that I'm sure some people have of, do you get do you get rid of uh, eggs if they're there, or do you not get rid of eggs that are that are there? And I think we have touched it on it before in, in previous um, webinars. Of it depends on if the bird is a determinant layer or an indeterminate layer. Determinant layers lay um, a set amount of eggs, 
And if they don't have that set amount, then they can continue to lay. So for the determinant layers, it's kind of best to just like leave those eggs there. But for the indeterminate layers, the ones who are not counting their eggs and can have a variable amount um, for them, it may be better in some cases to actually get rid of those eggs because sometimes if those eggs are sitting there, then they are feeling hormonal because, oh my gosh, I need to sit and protect this little thing. Um, and so in those cases, sometimes it is better to get rid of them. But I would say it's something that people really need to talk about, uh, talk with their individual veterinarian about um, and see what's best for that individual bird. Okay. Um, and then we had a question about contact calling. Um, so when you say uh, uh, the bird is sort of screaming, like contact calling, um, they, it, uh, contact calling is important in terms of bird comfort, right? Um, is it only a problem when it's in conjunction with other issues? That's the question. The question yes. is contact calling. Yeah. So is it only a problem if it's in conjunction with other issues? Well, it, I mean, it's going to depend on, is it a problem for the person in their home? Um, and so for some people, a screaming bird in their house, they could care less, um, versus other people are very sensitive to noise. Um, so it's going to depend a little bit on, on the individual home. I have to say in my house, um, I don't, I don't mind the birds calling, uh, but I have tried to make it so that like, if they do contact call, we do something that sounds nicer. So for example, Arroyo, he will contact call, but the way he, we've got him to do contact calling is rather than just like a scream, if he wants us to like actually respond back to him, he has to say something that <laughs> is in human language. So a lot of times his contact call is just hello. He'll just say out hello. And then we say hello back and forth. Because I don't know, it seems a lot nicer to be saying hello than, then bird screaming and you know even though my plan is to have Arroyo forever um and never have to like have him go to another home the reality is is birds live a very long time and they most of our longer lived species don't live with one person their entire life and so if I'm going to set this bird up for success even though my goal is for him to be with me again forever yeah if something were to happen where I wasn't able to care for him or something like I suddenly passed away and he needed to have a new home. My hope is that he could go into a new home and be pleasant for those people and not have him be cycling through a bunch of different homes because sadly I heard one statistic that like the average bird has eight different homes in its life which is really sad you know and so if I can set him up for success by contact calling with saying hello which is a much more pleasant thing to hear than a real scream that's what we try for. <laughs> so, nice. so it's also just redirecting what um, is appropriate for contact calling and what works in your home. And maybe if your bird isn't a talker, like a, maybe a cockatiel, you get it to, to whistle a certain whistle segment, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Something uh, I know a lot of cockatiels do the Andy Griffith show tune, you know, so like maybe getting them to do that, you know, is much more pleasant to hear than something else. Nice. Okay. Um, and then we have a question. Someone, uh, they have several bird species in the same room. Um, can you tell if one species is a female could affect a male of a different species? Should they be kept in separate um, areas during hormonal times? Or do you think it um, helps to keep the minds busy? So you might, you might have different birds, uh, male, female, but different species. Um, do you separate them during hormonal times? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And that is one that I'd probably have to actually be in that home and see the interaction of what's going on. Because um, going back to cockatiels, because um, cockatiels are just great examples. A lot of people have them. They're easy to keep or easier to keep than some other species. Um, and um, they're very hormonal. Um, cockatiels will be stimulated just by hearing their mate or hearing a mate. So if they hear an other cockatiel, that can be hormonally stimulating to them. So there are some species where yes, that could potentially be a problem. You may need to separate males and females, but if you have a mixed bird home and you know, is like the cockatiel gonna be stimulated by the call of the eclectus? Um, and geez, I'd have to sit there and watch that interaction to see if that was the case or not. And if they needed to be separated because yeah, you'll have different species who sometimes pair up that you would not expect to pair up. Um, so that's a little bit of a difficult question to answer. So I hope I kind of, yes, no, maybe. <laughs> okay. okay, could be an individual bird. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, on that note, that was, uh, it looks like we're almost out of time and I got to announce today's uh, giveaway winner. Uh, so I wanted to thank you for, I know you had to make some quick adjustments uh, before we jumped on this webinar with your PowerPoint, not your internet going down. I mean, that's, that's what live webinars are kind of exciting about because you never know what could yeah. happen. 
<laughs> it was uh, you walked us through that very well and um hopefully we'll be able to put that powerpoint uh, visual uh when we do the recording of the video so uh, and then a royal thank you for to again demonstrating your wonderful mastery of tricks <laughs> That's a little awesome. less motivated today, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you did talk about, you talked about foraging earlier and you had to kind of come up with a, like a, a foraging fix on the sly, on the fly with your gray, cause you put the baba cake in the, um, the foot toy. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, all right. So today's winner is, uh, let's see, where is that? I just had it, where'd it go? Um, ah, George, George T, congratulations. You are today's giveaway winner. And what I'm going to do, everyone's saying thank you. And of course, we all appreciate you joining us on these Fridays, Dr. Lamb. It's, it's very nice of you. Um, yeah, of course. Be very gracious of your time. And as I, before I hit the video, because it's it's a very cute video of Arroyo again um, with our giveaway product for the month. Um, just give me a sneak preview. Uh, uh, next Friday, wow, is it already March? Wow, March 11th, uh, we're doing the avian uh, coronavirus, avian gangli ganglion neuritis. I hope I said that right. Your question. Neuritis. Thank you, gangloritis <laughs> with uh, with Dr. O's and Bob, uh, Bob uh, Dr. Dalhausen uh, will be on with us. And then we're, we're cooking up some good uh, ones for April too. Um, sorry, we do have uh, March 18th, we got grays and hormones um, with uh, Lisa Bono and then ask the vet at the end of the month. And then April, um we might have scott eccles back on with us so that'll be a, an exciting webinar so those are some sneak um peeks for y'all and i am going to play our video uh giveaway um let's see here i'm sure you'll this will look familiar to you dr lamb um oh, where'd it go where'd it go there we go because <laughs> it's it's a let's see come on play Is it not playing? Okay, come on. Everyone's waiting. There we go. It is the uh, Sunny Orchard Nutriberries. Royal just got there in these go. new Nutriberries that he hasn't had before. Yeah. These ones have cranberries, apricots, and dates. I did load foraging toys in his <laughs> house here. Look at all his foraging toys. You mentioned those earlier. <laughs> so let's see what he thinks. He's on his tree stand. There he goes. <laughs> Is that a he move, he moves fast when he sees his uh he's got a treat to get to, right? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> that is oh look at that. <laughs> See? What do you think, Royal? Look at his eyes, that they're all excited. Good? Oh, a little bit of eye pinning there. <laughs> eye pinning usually means it's pretty good. Yeah. And Sunny Orchard Nutriberry is just I like a, they be can be fed as a as a main part of the diet instead of a, 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 as a, a, also a foraging um, supplement. There you go. What do you think about this new flavor? You haven't got to have this one before. Is it good? Yeah. Do you find it enjoyable? <laughs> Mm. He's holding on. He's clutching that thing like he doesn't want to drop it. <laughs> it's really good, huh? Oh, that's adorable. I love, I love the little Amazon squeal when they get something they really like. Um, there you go. Uh, the Sunny Orchard Nutriberries. That's going out to you, George, and your bird, as well as another Lefebvre product of your choice. So. There we go, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this Friday. Dr. Lamb, again, thank you always um, yep. time in your busy day. So, all right, everybody. No so till next time, everyone uh, have a great weekend. All the best to you and your flock and stay safe. Bye. Bye.